So now let's talk about complement control proteins. There are ways to regulate complement, to um, turn it down, to protect it. Um, so let's talk about these ways to control complement. And so presumably you remember the ways that complement is activated in the classical pathway and the alternative pathway and the lectin pathway. So let's uh, see a pathogen. Here's a pathogen. And on its surface, you should recognize a uh, C3 convertase, there's the alternative C3 convertase made of C3B with BB. And so that complex is going to, you know, cleave C3s into C3As and C3Bs. Um, you should recognize this complex here that I've just drawn, hopefully you recognize that, as the classical C3 convertase. It's made of C4B and C2A. And that can also cleave C3s into C3As and C3Bs. So there's an issue that comes up here. Um, if there are all these C3Bs on the surface of a pathogen, well, couldn't each one of them bind factor B, which would then be cleaved by factor D, and couldn't all of them form C3 convertases, the alternative C3 convertases? And the answer is yes, and that would be bad. We don't want too many C3 convertases on a pathogen. We just need a couple because they're enzymes and they will catalyze the reaction of cleaving C3 into C3 and C3B. So we only need a couple of C3 convertases. We don't need a lot. We don't need all of the C3Bs to be converted into C3 convertases. So there is a way to regulate this in the body. And that involves two new proteins. The first is factor H. So what is factor H? Factor H binds C3Bs just like factor B. So if we were going back to the alternative pathway, if you remember, um, factor B can bind uh, C3B, and then factor D would come along and cleave factor B into BA and BB, and then you'd have the formation of the alternative C3 convertase. Well, what factor H does is if factor H comes in and says, no, no, factor B, you're not coming in here, you're not binding this. So factor H comes in, binds C3B, and recruits another protein called factor I, which is a protease. And what, what's factor I going to cleave? Factor I is going to cleave C3B into, uh, it's going to cleave a little bit off of C3B. And what it's going to do is remove the site where factor B could bind. So now we have this protein, and we're going to give it a slightly different name called IC3B. So what's IC3B? It's just like C3B, but it cannot associate with factor B. So factor H comes in and binds all of these C3s, Bs, and factor I comes in then, recruited by factor H, and cleaves all of the C3Bs into IC3Bs. So what's the difference between a C3B and an IC3B? The major difference is that IC3B cannot bind factor B. So none of these can form uh, alternative C3 convertases. And you know what? That's fine. We've got a C3 convertase. we actually got two of them right here. We don't need any more. So that's what factor H and factor I do. They help prevent the um, runaway production of C3 convertases because if you have too many C3 convertases, then what you're going to do is you're going to just cleave all of your C3s, and you're actually going to deplete C3 in your bloodstream. And your uh, book talks about the fact that there's a, uh, a genetic disorder where if you lack factor I, then what happens to your C3Bs is that they all get converted into C3 convertases, and you, uh, when you have an infection, um, your C3 drops dramatically. Um, and you end up uh, having an immunodeficiency. So factor H and factor I help pr um, protect the uh, overproduction of the C3 convertase, the alternative C3 convertase. Now, you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, if a pathogen is covered in C3Bs, that allows it to be opsonized via the CR1 receptor. But now we have IC3Bs, right? Can those be recognized by complement receptors and participate in opsonization? And the answer is yes. So uh, there's a macrophage with a CR1 receptor, and we learned about that when we talked about opsonization. So a pathogen covered in C3Bs can be opsonized. Um, uh, it'll 
be uh, endocytosed or phagocytosed by the macrophage because of the CR1 protein, the complement receptor 1 protein binding CRB. Well, what about IC, I'm sorry, C3B? What about IC3B? Well, there are other complement receptor proteins called CR3 and CR4. CR3 and CR4 bind to the IC3B fragment. So even though the IC3B fragment won't participate in forming a C3 convertase, it can uh, participate in optimization. So that's where IC3B comes from, and uh, that's what C the role of CR3 and CR4. Okay, great. Um, there's another protein that regulates complement called factor P. It's the protector of the alternative C3 convertase. So here I've drawn a pathogen covered in a C3 convertase, the alternative C3 convertase. Now the pathogen doesn't want this thing attached to it. It would love to try to boot off um, this complex. So what factor B does, factor P, sorry, is it's a protector. It actually binds factor BB and C3B, so it binds the um, alternative C3 convertase and protects it against pathogens trying to remove it. Right? Pathogens have uh, defense mechanisms and they will defend and try to remove the uh, complement. Factor P protects the uh, convertase, the alternative C3 convertase, so that it can go on and cleave C3s into C3As and C3Bs. So that's factor P. Um, let's talk about uh, human cells. So I've drawn a couple of human cells here. Now it's kind of weird, I drew complement being fixed to human cells. Does that happen? At some low level, it does. So you remember the alternative pathway of complement activation. C3 gets near the surface of a pathogen and spontaneously converts to IC3, triggers the formation of the C3 convertase. So at some very low level, complement can be attached to human cells. Now, that would not be good because that would induce inflammation and membrane attack complex and optimization. So we don't want to attack our cells if there's nothing wrong with them. So uh, human cells have a way to inactivate complement uh, so that they don't get attacked by complement. So uh, the first protein I'll talk about uh, is DAF, uh, decay accelerating factor. So it's a human protein present on human cells, and its job is to uh, kick off C3Bs, right? So if a C3, I'm sorry, its job is to kick off factor BB. So um, if I back up there, back up. Um, there is a alternative C3 convertase on that first cell. That would be bad because that wouldn't allow C3s to be cleaved and fixed to the cell. So what DAF does is it um, boots off factor BB. So if that happens, now we don't have a C3 convertase, so it won't, the cell hopefully won't be decorated with more C3Bs. That's one way to help keep C3B off of a cell. Uh, the other way is another protein called MCP, which stands for Membrane Cofactor Protein. So what does MCP do? Well, if you remember from the last uh, slide, factor H and factor I, those help uh, cleave um, C3B um, and help it prevent it from forming uh, more alternative C3 convertases. So what MCP does is it can also boot off factor B, but it can also recruit factor I. And we just talked about factor I as a protease. And it will come and it will cleave C3Bs and change it into IC3B. And when it's in its IC3B version, it cannot bind factor B and it cannot form alternative C3 convertases. So MCP is another way by which you can keep uh, C3 convertases from forming on human cells. The last mechanism is um, a molecule called sialic acid, which is a uh, component of um, human cell surface carbohydrates. So what does sialic acid do to help you uh, keep complement off, right? Factor, uh, I'm sorry, sialic acid recruits factor H, binds factor H. And we just saw in the last slide, factor H is a protein that recruits factor I. So if complement gets uh, somehow accidentally attached to your cell, uh, your cells luckily are covered in sialic acid. 
which binds factor H. Factor H brings in factor I. Factor I is a protease, which will cleave um, C3B into IC3B, and then again cannot pre prevents it from uh, forming C3 convertases. So these are three mechanisms by which human cells can keep C3 convertases from forming on their surface. Um, the last thing we'll talk about with human cells is how they can keep uh, membrane attack complexes from forming on their surface. So if you accidentally get some C3 on your surface, the C3Bs, you, that might lead to accidental membrane attack complex formations. So we got to keep those off. So there are three proteins, um, DAF, HRF, and CD59. Um, all of these play a role in inhibiting the formation of the membrane attack complex. So if C3, if C5B uh, was formed in the general vicinity here, and that started to complex with C6 and C7 and C8 and tried to complex with C9 and poke holes in the surface of the cell, um, what these proteins do is they basically keep um, C9 from joining the fun and poking the holes. C5 is the actual, C9 is actually the major protein that will form the pore in the surface of cells. So the presence of DAF or HRF or CD59 on the surface of human cells inhibits the production of the membrane attack complexes. So these are just some ways by which um, human proteins can regulate or control complement.